Hello, hello, wonderful to have you here. In today's video, what I want to discuss is something that the commentaries describe as the threefold emptiness. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we think to the way the Buddha describes non-self, oftentimes, most of the time I would say, in the suttas, he does it in a negative fashion. He looks at particular objects in our environment, particular things that we experience, and describes, argues, shows how they are not ourself. They're not who we really are. Everything in our experience isn't who we really are. But this leaves, this particular strategy that the Buddha uses leaves open the possibility that there's some other kind of self that we're just not covering when we look at each of these individual objects. In other words, maybe this isn't our self, and that isn't our self, and the other thing isn't our self, but perhaps still we do have a self, or there is something to cling to that just hasn't been covered in this particular iteration of all these things around us. So in one of the early suttas, the Buddha considers the possibility that we do have a self, or that there is something that he says is permanent, everlasting, eternal, imperishable, and that will last forever and ever. Well, and what if there were such a thing, the Buddha asks. Well, if there were such a thing, then it wouldn't be the kind of thing that would give rise to, as the Buddha describes, sorrow, lamentation, pain, suffering, and all these other bad states. Now, why wouldn't it give rise to these to suffering and pain and all the rest? It wouldn't because it wouldn't change, right? By definition, what we're, what we're trying to find here is something that's permanent, that's everlasting, that doesn't change. If it doesn't change, then it's not going to create the kind of sorrow that, that stems from the change and death, decay of things in the world. Now, search for this kind of permanent, everlasting something is one of the main goals of many religious and other philosophical kinds of endeavors. In particular, in the Buddha's day, it was the goal of the Upanishadic seers and thinkers. These were uh, uh, Brahmins generally, people out of the Vedic Brahminic tradition, who had retreated into the forest and basically spent their time in meditation by doing philosophy, trying to figure out that permanent thing, that permanent essence that they could cling to, that they could hold to, and that would be liberative, that would liberate them from the the troubles, the trials and tribulations of ordinary life. And as some of us will know, in the Upanishads, they generally, there's the philosophy, the idea that Uh, By doing this kind of uh, investigation, one would find an essence, a permanent self, and what's called the Atman, the soul. And that when one discovered that this soul was identical to the universe, the universal principle of Brahman, that 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 knowledge of this unity, of this identity of our self with the universe, or with the universal principle at any rate, was itself liberative. So here, what the Buddha is doing is looking at this possibility and saying, well, look, if this were true, if there were such a permanent, everlasting, unchanging thing, then yes, it would not lead to sorrow. It would be, in the sense, liberative. It would lead, it would lead to, to happiness. Uh, and the Buddha goes on to say, if there were such a thing, it would make sense to to cling to it. It would make sense to want to possess it, to own it in a sense. Indeed, it would make sense to grasp at it. And But the Buddha goes on then to say that he sees no such thing, no such possession that would fulfill this criteria. He sees no such possession that we could own that is, as he says, permanent, everlasting, eternal, imperishable, and that will last forever and ever. And the commentary terms this the first emptiness. That's the emptiness of possessions. That no matter what possession we may hold to or cling to or possess or or own, it's not going to be something that lasts forever. 
anything that we can possess is something that will decay, that does not have a permanent existence. So that's the first emptiness. Now, secondly, the Buddha considers a doctrine of self. Uh, we've just uh, talked about possessions. Now let's talk about doctrines, in particular, a doctrine of self. That is to say, okay, so perhaps there's not a self that we can possess. Uh, that is to say, something we can possess that would be our self, let's say. That, that would be one possibility. But perhaps there's some other doctrine, some other doctrine of self, some other teaching, philosophy of self that would fulfill a similar role. He says that Buddha considers the possibility of a doctrine of self that he says uh, didn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. So many people in the Buddha's day, and indeed even nowadays, search for such a doctrine of self. Uh, we look at it, perhaps, in, in consciousness. We think of our, we come up with a doctrine of self where we are our consciousness, or where we are our body, or where we are some kind of inner seer that, that experiences all that we know. This is one way of understanding consciousness, indeed. And there are uh, an innumerable other uh, number of different doctrines we can come up with that we think is go are going to ground our happiness because we're looking for a doctrine that will give us such happiness, that will give us peace and happiness, this kind of liberation that the Upanishadic seers were looking for, indeed that, that the Buddha himself was looking for before he attained enlightenment. Uh, we think that we're going to find something and say, okay, now this is my true self. And indeed we may already feel like we've found a doctrine of self that reveals who we really are, that reveals our authentic self. Uh, I did a, a video in the past about this idea of authenticity, both its uh, benefits and its problems, and I'll leave a link to that video down below in the notes in case you want to you know, hear more about authenticity. In any event, what we're looking for is a doctrine that will reveal an essential self, a self that is unchanging, that's permanent, that's who we really are. And that therefore, since it reveals something permanent and unchanging, that therefore it will not give rise, as the Buddha says at the beginning, as, as I said, it will not give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, and, and so on, because it is revealing something that is supposedly permanent. However, the Buddha then goes on to say that he doesn't see such a doctrine of self that will fulfill that role. That is to say, that any doctrine of self we can come up with will be a doctrine that will lead to sorrow, lamentation, pain, and so on. It's not going to be a doctrine that is liberating, that is liberative, that is, uh, reveals uh, true happiness to us. Now, why might that be the case? In this uh, sutta that I'm discussing, the Buddha doesn't actually go into why that might be the case, but I think we can come up with some ideas. Now, first of all, our idea of who we are, our conception of self, our doctrine of who we really are, that changes over time. We see ourselves in different lights as we live our lives. Sometimes we may think of ourselves as a kind of inner seer that that it simply is a kind of a passive watcher of all that happens. At other times, we may think of ourselves as our bodies, as some physically instantiated thing that looks a certain way and that can perhaps lift a certain amount of weight or something like that, or run a certain amount of time in a mile or a kilometer. Or in other times, we may think of ourselves as doers, as people who are able to achieve certain things. These are all different ways of conceiving who we really are, of coming up with a doctrine of self. And the point is that this doctrine, or let's say its fit, the way this doctrine fits with how we think of ourselves, that's going to change. It's going to be different for different people. It's going to be different for us at different times in our lives. So if we fix upon a single doctrine, we're going to find ourselves being disappointed because we're going to realize that that doctrine doesn't fit from time to time. And as that doctrine becomes an ill fit, all of a sudden we're going to fall into a feeling of unsatisfactoriness, that, 
that somehow this thing that we thought was so helpful, well, it's really not. And yes, we can give a rough doctrine of self even on the Buddha's understanding by saying that, look, uh, you know, what our self is a sort of a, a an ever-changing stream of causally interconnected uh, aggregates, that is, these mental and physical states that go up, go into making up who we think we are. The, the, many of us will know that in the Buddhist understanding, the, the self is sort of constructed out of five aggregates, four mental parts and one physical, the body, the physical part. So yes, we can understand the self in that way, but that's a very rough kind of 10,000 foot kind of way of understanding a self. It's, it's not, I would say, thick and rich enough to really ground a true conception of self of the kind that the Buddha is looking for here and says he can't find. So this then is the second emptiness. That is the emptiness of a doctrine of self. That any true deep doctrine of self that we try to come up with is not going to be one that allows us to escape from sorrow and lamentation and pain. Indeed, any such deep doctrine of self will itself be productive of pain and suffering insofar as we grasp at it and then our, our conception changes over time. Now third, the Buddha considers the possibility of relying upon or gaining a grounding in some view some belief, some opinion that, as he says, doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, and all the rest. That is to say, he's expanding the, the, his, his uh, view here, his, expanding his vision, right? The first one was a possession. Okay, is there some possession? Well, no. Is there some view of, uh, is there some conception of self? That's a little bit broader, you know, some way of conceiving of ourself. Now, third, he's looking at any view at all, any belief at all, any, con any opinion at all that we might conceive of and hold to that would not give rise again to sorrow and so on. And the Buddha says, if there were, if there were such a view that would not give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, and so on, it would make sense to cling to such a view. If we could find such a view that would be a we might say, a sure refuge from suffering, then that view is a view that we should cling to. But, interestingly, fascinatingly really, the Buddha says there isn't such a view. And here, I think we ought to consider a very famous a parable that the Buddha gave, which is the parable of the raft. Uh, I did a, a separate video on the parable of the raft. I will leave a link to that video down below in the notes if you haven't seen it. Uh, it's an, an extremely deep parable that the Buddha gives, and indeed, that Buddha gives that parable in the very same sutta as the one I'm discussing now. Indeed, the discussion we're having right now in this video comes a little bit after he's discussed the parable of the raft. And what was the point of the parable of the raft? Well, the parable of the raft is to say that even the Buddha's teaching itself, even the Buddha's dharma itself, is not something that we should cling to. Instead, it's simply a conveyance, a raft, an object that gets us over the stream of suffering to the farther shore of enlightenment. Now, of course, while we're in the middle of the stream, we're going to need to cling to that raft to an extent because we're not enlightened yet. We're going to identify with that raft, we're going to hold tight to it, but as we get closer to that farther shore, as we reach that farther shore, eventually we're going to have to also realize that the raft itself has to be let go of. Um, so, th so that's something that we should maintain in our minds all throughout. That yes, we do want to hold to the Buddhist Dharma in a sense. We want to practice it. We, want, we, we will almost inevitably tend to identify ourselves with it. But that has to be thought of as temporary and indeed not to our best interests in the longer term. In the longer term, there's nothing, there's no view that we really should cling to. The Buddha goes farther in that very same sutta and discusses just the ways in which his own dharma, 
can lead to sorrow, lamentation, pain, and so on. Now, we've just said, the Buddha just said, okay, there's no view that won't lead to sorrow, lamentation, and pain. Well, what about the Buddha's Dharma itself? Yes, it too can lead to sorrow, lamentation, pain, and suffering. How so? Well, the very sutta in which we're discussing this also has a second very famous simile called the simile of the snake or the water snake. Indeed, that gives the name of the sutta. The sutta is known as the water snake sutta. And here the Buddha talks about how the Dharma is like a snake in the sense that if you grasp it rightly, you can make use of it. But if you grasp it wrongly, the, the snake will turn around and bite you and cause you deep suffering. Well, what does it mean to grasp the Dharma wrongly? Here the Buddha is very explicit. He says that to grasp the, the Dharma wrongly is to use it in a way to criticize others or to engage in arguments and disputes. That is the way indeed that many people grasp the Dharma even today. They'll use it as a kind of a cudgel to hit each other over the head. You know, you understand the Dharma wrongly, I understand the Dharma rightly, or your philosophy is wrong, my Buddhism is right, my Buddhism is better than your philosophy, and, and I'm going to argue about it with you. If we use the Dharma in this way to, as the Buddha says, find fault with others or simply to win debates, then we're using the Dharma in a way that it will turn and bite us. Because if we're going to use the Dharma to criticize others and win debates, what we're doing is creating arguments, disputes, dislike, enmity, anger, and hatred in the longer term between ourselves and other people. And this is one way that, the, the, that views, even around the Buddha's own beliefs, can themselves be problematic. And the Buddha not only realized this, but was very explicit about it. One often hears and reads such things online, for example, of arguments about, you know, I have right view and you don't have right view. Uh, your view is wrong. My view is better. These kinds of things. Now, to be absolutely clear, of course, there's nothing wrong with correcting in a kind way, trying to correct somebody who you believe has gotten something wrong. Indeed, the Buddha himself did that on numerous occasions. But there's a difference, and a very important difference, between correcting somebody kindly, at least as one best understands, in other words, one might oneself be wrong, but in one's limited understanding of the Dharma, one may kindly attempt to correct somebody else on, on something that one believes they've gotten wrong. There's a big difference between doing that and the kind of thing that one finds so often, which is either using anger or conceit to think my view is better than yours, I'm a better person than yours, you're a low down because you've gotten things wrong and I'm going to tell you off about it or I'm going to try to defeat you in a debate about it. These are the kinds of things that one finds more often, I would say, and they are the problem, according to the Buddha. So if we shouldn't be using views, beliefs, and opinions in these ways to puff ourselves up out of conceit or win debates with people, then what, we, what should we be using views and beliefs to do? Well, we should be using them as methods to attain calm, to attain wisdom, to attain eventually equanimity and enlightenment. These are the things that we should be using the, the, the views to do, and in that way views can indeed be a path, a path to a really secure foundation, to a more secure refuge for ourselves in the longer term. But we should understand that that pathway to our eventual happiness is not one of clinging to the views themselves. Because views themselves cannot lead to our true happiness by clinging to them or identifying ourselves with them, thinking that that's the view that I hold as opposed to that other view that I don't hold. These are the kinds of, of ways that views can bite us. And that indeed is the third emptiness.
So here we see these three forms of what are called emptiness, at least that's how the commentaries describe them. The emptiness of possessions, the emptiness of a doctrine of self, and the emptiness of views. Ordinarily, we will tend to cling to all of these three things, and I absolutely include myself in that everyone, and like all of us. I mean, I as well will tend to cling to things that I think I own. I will tend to cling to a doctrine of who I think I really am at any given time. And I will also tend to cling to views of various kinds. But the important thing is to try to gain a practice and continue a practice of seeing through these three forms of emptiness, of understanding them as empty as empty of a self, as empty of anything that's worth actually clinging to. Indeed, that is the true path that we find in early Buddhism, a path of relentlessly giving up our tendency to cling to and identify with and crave all of these different kinds of things. And uh, I did actually an er earlier videos on this very topic of non-clinging, of non-identification. I have a playlist and I'll leave a link to that playlist up here on the screen in case you haven't seen some of these other videos, which I recommend. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, do consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked down below, and seeing if you want to help support the work that we're all doing here. Thanks so much to all of you, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.